Thank you all for coming. Uh, for folks who have not joined us um, yet this summer for one of these, I want to make sure that you know who we all are and who we represent. So I'm Senator Becca Ballant. I'm chairing. I represent Wyndham County. I'm Representative Mike Antochka. I'm a representative uh, of Charlotte and part of Heinsburg. And I'm on the Energy and Technology Committee. I'm Andrea Papiti. I work for the Public Utility Commission, and I'm representing them here on this uh, committee. I'm Lauren Glendevee with the CCTV Center for Media and Democracy, and also here on behalf of the Vermont Access Network. I'm Karen Horn, and I'm with the Vermont League of Cities and Towns. And I'm Clay Purvis, and I work for the Department of Public Service. And we also have members of Ledge Council. Joint right. Oh, I'm so sorry. I no thought we problem. started with you. <laughs> My apologies. Uh, good morning. I'm Dan Glanville, yep. representing the industry, and I work with Comcast. Wonderful. Thank you. So we also have uh, members uh, from Ledge Council, from the Joint Fiscal Office, and um, our wonderful Mike Farron, who is helping us guide the ship to its conclusion in all various forms. So thank you very much. We're going to start, as we do, uh, with public comment. So my understanding is there, there are some folks who did want to offer some public comments this morning. Come on up, please. Introduce yourself. Madam Chair, Peter Wall. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, good morning. My name is Rob Chapman. I am the executive director of Orca Media, which is the access center that's based here in Montpelier. Uh, first of all, I just want to uh, again express uh, my appreciation for the work that the committee's doing. It's, we feel it's very important. Uh, I just wanted to ask uh, I understand that there is uh, part of this uh, process is a public hearing. And I wanted to know if it would be possible for us to get the specifics of that sooner rather than later. And I'm hoping that maybe by the end of this uh, meeting today, we might be able to get a date and a location for that. I know that there are a number of people in our communities that are interested in coming to that public hearing. I think it's an important part of the committee's work and being able to hear from those people. So that's my sort of request for this morning. Wonderful. I will just say I, I do not think we'll be able to get that to you before the end of the meeting today because we need to have some conversations about where that might be and the logistics of that. Yes. But I hope within the next week we'll be able to post something on the legislative website so Great. that Thank you, you very much. can get that information out to folks who would like to be present. Thank you. Yes. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I'm Stephen Whitaker from Montpelier. Um, the, f the focus that y'all are wrestling with, how to fund the access media organizations, I'd like to spend a few minutes to help you tie together how it affects other. Uh, the demise of Vermont Interactive Television a few years ago uh, left a big gaping hole. And I would encourage you to assign a task to council to search the statutes for all of the references to where video conferencing, teleconferencing is utilized. Uh, you're probably aware of uh, arraignments, et cetera. But in the budget development process that Department of Finance and Management is supposed to be actively engaged with the public in defining the priorities in the budget development. The only effective tool for that was VIT. Um, and it, all they've done now is create a web form. And that's totally ineffective. So there's many gaps that are left. Going forward, uh, many of the uh, consolidated public safety dispatch is going to necessitate intensive training around the state, participation in public utilities commission, uh, public hearings, and even dockets is going to require interactive television. But I would encourage, and I've made this point at, at the PUC, that we not settle for a compressed, low quality yesterday's technology, that we really use it to demonstrate the fiber capacity that we have here in Vermont, the ultra low latency, high definition, uh, as a way to demonstrate and uh, showcase what our infrastructure is that could support economic development. Um, part of the reason we're here is the reframing of uh, 
accounting rules for cable companies, uh, which is severely impacting the finance for the access media organizations. I think we need to look at the length of. Why don't you hold on a second, Stephen? Apologies. Yes, it's right. Yes, all right, thanks. Uh, certificates of public good, I would ask you to consider whether or not those need to be reduced from 11 years, possibly to seven or five. I'll note that uh, incentive regulation plans governing consolidated, those are three-year plans. But the fact that Comcast CPG ran 11 years and then has been extended through uh, gaming or litigation into you know, 14 or more is uh, unconscionable. Uh, the, the public benefits that were to be accrued under the last CPG were not adhered to, and now we've lost a several more years. Uh, one benefit of financing access media organizations and peg stations from public money would be increased transparency and accountability. Uh, right now, it's kind of a, a loose federation, is probably the generous way to say it, of independent entities that all play by their own rules, do or don't uh, archive the footage, uh, et cetera. So increased accountability adhering to public meeting, open records, record retention schedules would be an increased benefit of access media organizations being funded with public funds. Are you talking about increased accountability for public access? Yes. Uh, Between and among public access and to the people that they are uh, to be serving, which is not only cable subscribers, but uh, mm -hmm. they are in effect the community memory of Vermont, uh, archiving and sharing this content. Mm -hmm. Um, so, Stephen, we have about four minutes for a public comment. Is there anyone else in the room that needs to speak? Great. So, if you could, sure. that would be wonderful. Um, you. I'd ask you to take a look at the telephone personal property tax. Uh, there has been a 10 year docket this is in Vermont that's been to the Supreme Court twice, and it's still. It's been 14 months or 15 now, and the PUC has not ruled on a motion for reconsideration by Comcast. Again, we're gaming the system, but telephone personal property tax is in statute, and for any company providing telephone, owning telephone lines, which would include VoIP over coax, which would be Comcast and Charter, which would include VoIP over fiber, which would include First Light. These companies are supposed to be paying 2.37% of the total infrastructure value of all of their infrastructure in Vermont, fed, uh, valued according to their federal depreciation. But my off the back of the envelope, off the cuff calculation is that the last three years, they have obviously not been paying. We, the tax department is not at liberty to disclose who's been paying and who hasn't, but you need to get to that information, uh, calculating the receipts. The receipts should have been going up as these hundreds of millions of dollars have been invested in telephone infrastructure, and they've been going down dramatically. So we don't know how many of the companies are paying, but my calculation estimate is that three years recoverable might amount to as much as $100 million. Um, so asking directly whether Comcast and First Light have been paying the telephone personal property tax on their federally depreciated infrastructure would be a, a good place to start to look for money to fund the AMOs. Um, the reliability of these networks uh, is essential, that public access stations are in an emergency situation, which we are likely to see more of, uh, public access stations, possibly even including community radio, are going to be the, the go-to for instructions on where to get water, where to get food, how to, who needs taken care of. And so we need to design our networks so they're most resilient and survivable. We cannot have a company 
a stockholder company like Comcast or First Light deciding how much resiliency and redundancy to protect the network with. We need to bring this network reliability in favor with the rationale that that's going to support and keep the AMOs online as a place to get current information and know what to do in an emergency. So, Stephen, one more minute, okay? That's and enough. anything, okay. I'll and drop it there unless you've got questions. You should always feel free to send your remarks to us in writing as well, and we will make sure that they get posted along with the other information. You, you've got a relationship between the 10-year telecommunications plan, the health IT plan, the five-year IT plan, and an emerging consolidated dispatch plan. All of those plans need to account for the role of the access media organizations in educating I don't disagree. I just want to make sure we have modest goals for this committee and the amount of time that we have to address these issues. So I, I appreciate that you always give us broad scope and con context, and that's important, but I want to make sure that I'm clear with the audience what our charge is here, that we are trying to ensure that long term that our public access TV stations are financially viable because we know that they're critically important to our communities. But I just, I want to be clear that we have a very narrow charge here. That doesn't mean that there aren't other committees within the legislature that can look more broadly. Um, but I want to be clear where I'm coming from. I don't know if there are other people on the committee that disagree with that sentiment, but I want to give you an opportunity to weigh in now. I concur with that. Okay. Yeah, I concur with that, but I also encouraged Stephen to come and sure. speak today because yeah. I think there is a bigger context that it's helpful for us to be aware of. Absolutely. Yeah. So. It should be it should be guiding our work. I just I think sometimes in the legislature we um, we forget what you can get done in five or six <laughs> meetings, and I want to make sure that we are very tenacious about what our charge is and making sure that long term we have a, have a funding stream and that is um, certainly going to be informed by the context. So I appreciate uh, you coming and giving your time and I appreciate that you invited Mr. Whitaker here. So thank you. And as always, if there are folks um, who would like to testify in future, we start each meeting with public comment. At this point, if there are no more comments from the uh, committee before we begin, I'd love to turn it over to, to Mr. Glanville, who is going to be talking about uh, an update on the Comcast CPG. Great. Thank you, Senator. Thank you. Uh, thank you for uh, giving me the time here. Uh, we uh, have been working uh, with all of the AMOs through their representatives uh, to resolve this matter, uh, also with DPS. Uh, we worked uh, diligently through the spring and summer uh, in multiple negotiation sessions uh, with a uh, mediator in place in Burlington, uh, and we have successfully resolved the issues before us. Uh, next week, we'll be presenting a filing uh, to the PUC for consideration uh, and adoption for uh, appropriate uh, amendments. So I'm going to go through the details, uh, basically, of what they are. What I'm going to leave out, there are some uh, financial provisions in here as well. I'm going to leave those out at this juncture, uh, other, other than to say there are some uh, fairly significant financial provisions in there as well, which will be outlined in the filing uh, next week. Uh, but the main issues uh, for consideration just want to make sure that since this hasn't been filed with the commission yet that we're just sticking to what will be said and not commentary and, and such is that is that a good understanding of what oh absolutely what are you expecting sure okay I'm yes just trying to be cautious because since it, I work for the commission and it hasn't been filed with the commission yet so. great I mean there is the opportunity I don't know if we want to consider it that we could do it in executive session I would have to excuse myself. Um, so, is there a chance? I don't know, Clay. What do you think? Uh, no, I think you highlighted an important concern because um, you are a member of the commission, uh, or excuse me, not a member, but St a staff of yes. the commission. Uh, didn't mean to promote you, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but um, uh, 
Yeah, I mean, the, the, the ethical rules for uh, the courts would apply here, I would think. Um, off, just off the top of my head, I, I would review them, but uh, something to consider that I had not considered walking into the room. So I, I could excuse myself. If, if that feels most comfortable for you, then I'd encourage yeah. you to do that. Okay. Okay, thank you. Yeah. This is it's one of the things that we've learned from um, this work group is that there are all kinds of, of overlaps and um, somewhat uh, awkward and uncomfortable uh, connections and situations, and yet we need all these people at the table for us to wrestle with this issue. So I appreciate your candor, and we'll, we'll have you come back in when Mr. Glanville's done. Well, I'm curious if we should do this in executive session now, since because it's going to be taped and, uh, and aired. Uh, it's just a brief overview of the parameters. I don't want to overstep, and I don't want to in any way muddy any waters of what's going to be filed next week. So the purpose of your testimony on, on this today is to inform us with regard to funding for the public access stations? Just the overall resolution of the CPG issue. Mr. Purvis? I was, was going to ask, have all the parties signed, signed the... Uh, well, they signed the settlement, and uh, absolutely, and it's been, yeah. I don't feel like we need to go into executive session. Probably, fine. I don't know, I, I, would, I would hesitate to give an opinion. One way Maybe or the other. Maria <laughs> has some advice. <laughs> Council. <laughs> So I haven't considered this at all, and you know, just saying that at the outset. Is the concern, I'm not exactly sure what the concern is, a public document, you're discussing something that may or may not be adopted by the PUC? Right, it is, it is a public document, correct? It's not. not. Yeah. Well, it will be, it, it's it will not be. yet. The filing will be public next week. Right, I think when we discussed this at the last meeting, we had anticipated that it would have already been filed by now, so. Okay. So here's what I say. Let's take a two minute recess while I talk to my vice chair and with council and we will reconvene in two minutes. Okay. Thank you. Great. Okay. Thank you. So I should start by apologizing. I should know by now, five years into the legislature, you never say we'll take a two minute break. That, <laughs> that never happens. <laughs> so um, I apologize. Um, after discussions with um, the, the vice chair and with council, we are in agreement that we do not want to go into executive session. That is not um, the direction that we want to go in. We are interested in having uh, Mr. Glanville and Mr. Purvis, if they are able to, to give us a, an overview of what the issues are that have been discussed. We do not need to know the details. We understand that it has not been, been finalized, it has not been filed, it's not a public document. However, the charge of the committee, I think it's important for us in order to get to some solutions to understand what are the issues that are on the table. So that is our proposal. I'm wondering if you are each comfortable with that. I am. Great. Wonderful. Let's proceed. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, I will not cause any more two-minute breaks. Uh, I hope. Um, so the issues uh, are, are, are pretty succinct uh, that have been resolved. Uh, the, one of the big issues is the issue pertaining to AMO access to the interactive program guide. Uh, we believe we have uh, successfully uh, negotiated and resolved that issue. Uh, we have a uh, resolution uh, to the issue of uh, line extension requirements. Uh, also, there is an issue with, with what's known as ROS, return, remote origination site, also known as return line uh, capability. Uh, so that is there as well. Uh, simultaneous uh, live PEG programming uh, also uh, resolved. Uh, issues pertaining to institutional network uh, also uh, resolved. Uh, and those are the main issues uh, that were under dispute and that mm -hmm. we believe have been uh, favorably resolved. Clay, I'm not sure if I missed anything for I don't think you have. I think that's a good, succinct uh, that, that was a pretty issues. quick uh, <laughs> list. So uh, it, it, I got AMO access to program guides, line extension requirements, return line capabilities, 
Is that what you said? I, I, I think that ROS. Uh, ROS. ROS, uh, which stands for Remote Origination Site. We also call them return lines. That's the ability to go live from a location, like a municipal location. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Like here. Yeah. Lauren Glenn, can you just bring the mic a little bit yes, closer I'm to you? Sorry. No, so that's okay. Re remote Origination Site allows an access center to go live from a remote location, such as the State House, for example. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then institutional network you, you mentioned, and was there something else that's that I missed? It. I'm sorry, Lauren Glenn. Institution. You, uh, that was the last one. That was the last institutional one. Institutional network was the last one. Right. Was there something in between? No. Oh, simultaneous live programming. Simultaneous live programming. That's the ability of an access center to run live programming on more than one channel at the same time. So okay. if you have a P, an E, and a G channel, you could go live simultaneously from those three channels. Okay. Lauren Glenn is my translator this morning. Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Technical mumbo jumbo, so thank you. Clay, anything you'd like to, to add? Uh, no, I think that that's a succinct statement of the issues. Uh, considering that we're filing next week, yeah. perhaps the following meeting we could have a more in-depth conversation of what the, the settlement agreement contains, because it'll be public at that point. That would be great. And if as, as soon as that is public, if you could make sure you get a link to Mike so that he can send that document directly to the committee members and so that we can... I will do that. Per, Absolutely. You know, we can certainly dive into that well before the meeting. <coughs> Questions for either um, Clay or Dan? Anything else you'd like to say? I did have a, okay, uh, great. a handout document yep, that I, I was going to clarify that. from our, our last meeting. Wonderful. Uh, We've made it uh, more viewable and uh, more accessible, uh, and we have made it available uh, electronically as well. I think some of the key points that we've updated it through Q3 of uh, 2019, and uh, Q3 of 2019 thus far uh, brings us to a total annual uh, combined payments of $5,104,586.11. The good news on that is that if you take that for the three quarters and add in the fourth quarter, you will see that uh, calendar year 2019 uh, is very consistent and in line with the prior seven years uh, of access funding. So uh, pretty consistent funding over those years. Uh, and as I stated, uh, the spreadsheet is also available to bring you back to 2006 when we first entered the market. When we entered the market, that annual number was roughly $3.5 million uh, and, it, and has increased uh, today uh, annually between about 6.8 and $7.2 million. Uh, so we think a good news story. Uh, and that's available to the, uh, to the uh, group as well. That's all I have, Senator. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Questions from the committee? Okay. Just keep in mind, this is Comcast revenue, so it isn't all the it isn't all the cable companies right. in the state, but it's the predominant one, obviously. Right. Yeah. Thanks for that clarification. And um, I've been on vacation, so basically forgot everything. Um, <laughs> so these revenues are from taxes or from? It is an assessment on our uh, cable subscribers for cable services. Okay, right, thank yes. you, thank you. Franchise fee. Huh? Franchise fee would be another way to think about it. Karen, did you have any other? Any no, questions? that's it, Okay, thank you. wonderful. So at this point, uh, we're going to move on to the topic of AMO governance, operations, and budgeting. And next on the agenda is Kevin Christopher from the Vermont Access Network. And I think Elizabeth Malone Wonderful. from Northwest him. Access, Executive Director there. Wonderful. Are you going to testify joining. together? Yep. Yeah. Great. Presentation. Yeah. Why don't we do view and we'll do full screen? Uh, where did it go? Oh, yeah, thank you. It's hard to read sideways. So yeah. just these buttons will go up and down. Okay, thank you. 
Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, I am Kevin Christopher. I'm the executive director of Lake Champlain Access TV in Colchester and the president of the Vermont Access Network until May of next year. And I'm Elizabeth Malone, and I serve Northwest Access TV in St. Albans, Vermont. Thank you for coming. Thank you for your time. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Great. So the presentation we have today answers a few questions that came up at the last meeting, and that's uh, where our funding comes from, uh, what informs and who oversees the spending of that funding, and to whom we are accountable and how we make oversight Could you speak accountable. Into the, um, oh, sure. a little bit more. Okay. You think I know that? Uh, so we start by looking at revenue. Uh, as you see, this pie chart tells a very clear story. Um, nearly all of our funding comes from cable peg fees. Mm -hmm. The remaining about 10% is made up of everything from fundraising from individuals or municipal contributions uh, to underwriting sponsorship. That's the 0% is actually about a half a percent. Okay. And the other 4% can be made up from uh, paid production services, class fees, or other smaller sources. But as you see, this, uh, this funding has really driven how we, how we do our work, which is in almost entirely direct services. So pivoting quickly to becoming a fundraising organization like a traditional nonprofit is, uh, is not really in our purview of where we're at now. So looking at how we spend about $8 million that we receive every year, uh, we have 24 studio locations across the state. Um, and even though we have so many locations, it's still a good hour drive for some of our producers to reach their nearest access center. So as we all know, transportation is an issue in the state. So having being as close as possible to truly allow access is really important for the state of Vermont. We have 81 commercial free channels, and that's both, this is where the peg comes in, public, educational, and government access channels, and those are both high definition in some areas and standard definition in the most areas. We also provide about 200 jobs to Vermonters, and this is where the majority of our expenses lie. Uh, over 65% goes directly to employing Vermonters and really serving direct, directly serving the public. So we don't have those folks that other nonprofits would like a fundraising or marketing person. Pretty much every single staff person is directly serving the public. In partnership with the schools, the residents, the nonprofit organizations, and the municipalities of our areas, we provide over 18,000 hours of programming every year. So it's a great partnership that we've built with, we've built with all of our community members um, to pull off this much work. And the final number here is a million dollars in equipment that's available to the public. We're kind of like a production library, if you will. In the same way that people go and sign out a book, they can go and sign out the media equipment they need and also get the training that they need to use that equipment. Before we leave that section, questions for Elizabeth on that part. Um, I, I do. Um, just uh, thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, with regard to the overall funding, uh, I know last week there was some discussion given to uh, charging uh, members of the community for use of facilities. Is that separately in any way uh, put together in a review, perhaps in your annual report or elsewhere? Um, I don't believe that any of us require payment to use our facility. Some of us have supporting memberships, kind of like Vermont Public Radio or Public Television does. It's free access to everyone, but we encourage, uh, if the community is able and willing to support our mission, we invite them to do so. But I'm not aware of anyone that requires payment in order to use uh, the facility. So are you trying to get at how much of that $8 million is from? Yeah, from the from the I, we had talked about some local government contributions last at our last meeting. Yeah, so that's all that that four percent of individual and that's municipal the other? Contri no, that's the red uh, the red piece of the pie there. Individual and ah. municipal contributions together, and you have that. Oh, as, okay. As 4%. You have that as a handout. Got it. Well. 
Thank you very much. And the municipal is definitely the larger of that 4%. Okay. And I just had a quick question in terms of, I can make some guesses, but I'd love to know where, where's the high definition capability? Is that mostly in the Chittenden so, area? Uh, that's Burlington Telecom offers them and Vitel. Uh, Vitel and Charter, it was part of Charter's most recent CPG. Um, do you, excuse me, do you know Charter's a lot of the HD? Yeah. Okay. okay. So there are two AMOs who are chartered who may have HD channels as well. Okay. Mm -hmm. But the majority do not. Right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I'm just going to talk a little bit about uh, how we are structured and uh, in, in relation to that, how we're accountable for uh, the monies that we're getting primarily from uh, cable subscribers around the state. Uh, we are 25 independent and autonomous uh, 501c3s. Uh, we're each uh, nonprofits. I, uh, I believe you all have a, a sampling of mission statements from organizations around the state. They're all a little different, but there are some things I think you'll find uh, similar uh, through those. Uh, we foster free speech. We um, provide education and training to community members. We provide a, a connection to local governments and uh, government transparency. So we're all doing essentially the same thing in uh, slightly different ways across Vermont. Um, we're over, uh, overseed, overseed? Overseen. Uh, overseen <laughs> uh, by volunteer boards of directors. Um, those can be organized by geography. They can be organized by cable subscriber numbers in a particular uh, community. Uh, they can be organized sometimes by our PE&G, Public Educational and Government, uh, the three types of access. Uh, board members can be appointed by municipal boards or school boards. They can be appointed internally. They can be elected by uh, community members. They can be at large. Um, some uh, AMO boards uh, have staff members, uh, AMO staff members on, on the board. Um, the number of, of members and frequency of meetings uh, can vary a little bit across the state, but we are all meeting at least quarterly uh, with our boards to, to guide the organizations. Um, the boards, uh, our boards provide accountability in terms of uh, budgeting just like a school board would or a, a select board. Um, they're part of the budgeting process from, from drafting the budgets, uh, planning, uh, long-term planning, uh, the approval, and then the review as, as, the, uh, as the fiscal year is going on. Um, the, I, I think we all do this in some way. It can be very different, but we're all doing some sort of community needs assessment in our organization, and that's really what drives our planning, our budgeting, and our services to the community. Um, and I'm going to get into that a little more right now. Um, I have provided a number, there's a, a link I think that you have with a number of community needs assessments from around the state. This is my organization's community needs assessment. Um, we all approach this a little differently based upon uh, capacity, based upon the funds we have available. Uh, they can include things like um, the surveying, written surveying, online surveying, in-person surveying, um, analysis. I think all of them would uh, include some sort of analysis among board and staff of the needs of the organization. Uh, in our most recent um, community needs assessment, we uh, did a, a big phone poll with the Castleton Polling Institute, which is where we got uh, most of our good information to, to kind of uh, guide us through our next five years. Um, community meetings are a big part. Uh, these can be uh, either whole communities, uh, sectors of communities. Uh, I know we've, and other organizations have uh, split it up educational communities, uh, government communities, spiritual and religious, which is a big part of uh, the services we provide are to church groups and other spiritual groups. Um, sometimes we uh, divide those sorts of meetings as well with that PENG to kind of uh, get all of our users there. Um, from all, and one-on-one -on -one interactions, I think, are, are very important. Um, with our most recent CNA community needs assessment, we had over, I think, two dozen one-on-one -on -one interviews where we talked to 
both existing and potential users about what they wanted from us, what we were doing right, and what we could be doing uh, better to serve our communities. Um, so how does that hold, help hold us accountable? How do our boards hold us accountable? Uh, I think there are various processes in place um, to make sure we're using the monies we receive in the best way possible. Uh, it's, it's largely results-based. It's the goals that we set forth in our strategic plans, which are the result of these needs assessments. Um, are, we, are we meeting those goals? Are we providing the communities that we serve with what they indicated that they wanted in those uh, planning processes? Um, the uh, there's a, a community oversight that happens. Uh, I should have mentioned that. Our boards of directors, these members come from the communities we serve, um, almost uh, uniformly across the state. The AMOs are um, populating their boards with people from their uh, geographic service area. So those are, those are part of the people that we're serving. So it's uh, being accountable to those boards and, and that two-way conversation there between um, boards and communities and the staffs of these AMOs. Um, another uh, big part of how we're accountable, especially with the state, are our annual reports. So we are required by Rule 8, which is the uh, Public Service Board, now the PUC, rule that um, governs uh, telecommunications, and uh, specifically Rule 8.4, to uh, uh, to submit a, an annual report every year. That goes to our cable operators, uh, be it Comcast or some other cable op. Uh, it goes to the PUC, it goes to the Public uh, Service Department, and it goes to VAN. Um, so I send mine to myself. Um, and that, uh, that summarizes uh, budgeting for the previous year, spending for the previous year, uh, tier usage, uh, programming information, uh, anything else that I'm missing in there? Yeah, general services. General services. Um, future planning Future, future planning, there's a, there's a planning consideration part of that um, that looks out uh, at least three years to what we hope to, to accomplish. Um, so that is the real piece that uh, is, is very tangible and is going to these different bodies. Um, who are looking at what we're accomplishing, what we're spending, and uh, sometimes asking questions about, about what we've submitted to them. Um, this is a, um, this is a, rule 8.4 is uh, somewhat general about the um, requirements for this reporting. Uh, the Vermont Access Network has worked um, for years on perfecting might be a strong word, but uh, developing a form so that we can collect uniform data mm -hmm. among AMOs. Okay. So uh, we all use the same form and submit that each year. Um, I also want to, this is, this is kind of a, a, a different way of looking at account accountability, but um, AMO coordination and the work that we do together um, within and uh, without VAN. Um, first of all, th there is the VAN uh, board and the, the um, organization of the Vermont Access Network. Uh, that's fostering accountability with that annual report form. Um, in, in our participation in regional and national membership groups, uh, I think that's uh, very important so that we are uh, doing what, doing our due diligence on a national level, being aware of what's going on in terms of, of regulation uh, and um, FCC orders, for example, uh, beyond Vermont. Um, we, many of you know this, but we have uh, created something that's been in place for quite a while now called the Vermont Media Exchange. This is a program uh, sharing um, back channel, if you will. Uh, this is the way we're able to, uh, in the old days of mailing, mailing um, videotapes, this, this replaces that. This is the way we're able to send our content across the state uh, easily, and uh, that's really uh, been a boon to uh, many of our AMOs, especially the smaller ones, to, uh, to have a wider variety of content uh, if they're not able to produce as much as they would like to because of their capacity. 
Um, certainly, we just hit upon this, but our uh, legal and regulatory efforts, Van has been a major driver of that. Uh, since uh, 2013, um, we, our members have spent uh, around $300,000 on legal and regulatory efforts. Uh, starting with the Charter CPG in 2013 and through Comcast CPG up until this very day uh, when things are still happening. Is that a cumulative 300000 or? Yes. Okay. Yeah. How much is that per year? Uh, uh, math. Um, <laughs> 60000 a year? Yeah. Okay. And that's, yeah, that's, um, that hasn't been, it, it's, sort of an all-at-once kind of prospect. Uh, we, we get, uh, there are periods of non-activity and then we're back in the, in the ring there. Um, so that's been a huge part of what Van has been doing for uh, almost a, a decade now is, is in those sorts of uh, proceedings. And um, we're also really fostering collaboration and support uh, that can be, um, Things like sharing policies, sharing our HR work, things mm -hmm. like that. Uh, just being support mechanisms for our fellow executive directors and other staff members across the state. Uh, and I mentioned this briefly uh, last meeting, but uh, there's, there are two AMOs in Burlington uh, that are, are in the process of becoming something called the Media Factory. So um, combining their resources and their knowledge into a, a single entity uh, to better serve their community um, as a one-stop um, media shopping center. Is that it? So any questions on that? Yeah. Um, have you found that your legal and regulatory expenses have, um, have you found that your legal and regulatory expenses have increased uh, over recent years, over what they used to be, and what would be the reason for that? Uh, yes, we've well, we've been involved uh, working with Comcast on the CPG renewal for a number of years now, so that's been a, a lot of those expenses, mm. um, first through the, the regulatory CPG process, and then through what we've been doing in uh, federal court. Okay, and I, I have one question regarding, you said you have 25 independent autonomous uh, 501c3 organizations and 24, 24 studio locations, yes. so what's the extra one? Uh, <laughs> so those two Burlington organizations that are uh, joining forces as the Media Factory, that's Vermont Community Access Media and okay. uh, the Regional Educational Television Network, uh, they share one studio space. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Yeah. That clarification. <coughs> so something that was brought up in one of the last meetings was a um, statewide TV channel. Is that something that would fall under your purview of Van or um, theoretically? You know, theoretically? Yes, I think um, uh, we would have to um, petition to be uh, the AMO for such a channel, um, which has been certainly discussed in a theoretical fashion. Yeah. But not a priority. Yeah. Um, it, it, it's something that's on our horizon. Yeah. Our, okay. yeah. Thanks. Yeah. I, I wonder. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Well, maybe the chair should pick. I, don't know. <laughs> uh, I, I did call on Clay, so why don't we oh, go okay. Clay and then uh, to thank you. Karen? Um, so you mentioned the, the media factory. Could you talk a little bit about other ways that? Um, the AMOs uh, maybe share resources or share costs, and if there are any plans to do more sharing in the future as a cost savings measure, or I guess, how, like how do, um, I guess as a second question, how have you guys become lean over the years um, uh, and kind of become more efficient? Just some examples. Mm -hmm. could. I would say we're certainly very lean to begin with. Um, you know, we were talking earlier this week, you know, none of us have... Elizabeth, can you slide the mic over? Um, so our staff is incredibly lean. We typically have an executive director at every location, and in some places that's the entire staff. Mm -hmm. It is just an executive director. Doing but, all the stuff. Yes, but honestly, we are not glorious executive directors. The majority of the executive directors 
do direct services and we get our hands on cameras pretty regularly. Um, so we're already operating pretty leanly. I think as an organization, VAN has grown tremendously and matured and that investment in legal and regulatory work is a real demonstration of that. In the past, the larger of the studios who could afford to pay for that sort of work were involved either individually or in a much smaller collaboration. At this point, VAN has grown into a statewide organization that definitely represents and involves, you know, both the Hardwick studio that's operating with a very small budget all the way up to some of the larger studios. Um, and I think in addition to the, the collaboration on legal regulatory, there's often um, a lot of sharing like Kevin mentioned along policies and things and really making the most out of the resources and not thinking of, well, I'm doing this work for the people of Colchester in this Colchester area. Mm -hmm. you know, Kevin is very generous about sharing you know, um, what, he's, what he's dedicated in funding toward policy development that maybe someone in a smaller studio like Hardwick just simply doesn't have the funding to, uh, to allocate. Can I just add something there? In terms of economies of scale, I think you spoke about the geographic location of these centers. So it, it's not easy for us to consolidate expenses mm -hmm. because we're it serving, is. I mean, it's almost like the small school issue, right? Um, but it's difficult for us to um, merge expenses that we have, and there are two reasons. One is geography, the other is the local nature. Mm. So if we were to say, let's all buy insurance from one insurance agent, everyone loves their local insurance agent and they're giving business to their local insurance agent. Mm -hmm. So to say Bennington and Brattleboro join, find some economy on insurance, sure. it, it's just not, it, and, it, and it's a common issue with nonprofits, we've looked quite a bit at the question of merging and consolidating resources, and it's not as straightforward as it appears. Mm -hmm. So I think, A, that we're lean, B, that we are serving these unique geographic areas that are hard to consolidate without de declining in service, and three, um, the nature of the services that we buy are very local, tend to be. Clay, did you have a follow-up? Yeah, I, I just had one more question, and I, I think you said it already, and I missed it. So, Van is, how is Van funded again? Um, is uh, we're funded almost, we're funded almost solely through membership dues. Okay, so the AMOs pay dues to Van, okay. Exactly. Yeah. Karen? So, I wonder um, if, if you have a sense of whether you're more regulated in Vermont than similar networks in other states, and um, that would contribute to your costs, more or less regulated. I think we actually benefit because unlike many other states, we're regulated on the state level as opposed to each municipality. Um, so the CPG applies to the entire state of Vermont as opposed to mm -hmm. I having to go and negotiate um, uh -huh. with, the t with the town mm -hmm. of St. Albans, say, and Kevin having to go and negotiate in the town of Colchester. It's a more predictable regulation, I think, mm -hmm. which is beneficial. Yeah. And keep in mind, the CPG is once every 11 years. So we really marshal our legal expenses for that decade Event, that event that happens once a decade. This one has been protracted, this most recent one, but that's unusual. But since the 90s, VAN members have pooled their resources to negotiate together with the, the prevailing cable operators. Hey, just a couple of questions. Uh, Kevin and Elizabeth, thank you very much for the presentation this morning. Um, I know when I presented, I talked a little bit about the uh, nearly doubling of funding made available to the AMOs uh, for the, over the last decade. I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit to that or if maybe you need some time to follow up in providing us some data in during that tenure, how the 200 employee count might have changed uh, and what the additional funding might have gone to uh, and, and, and how it was spent. Uh, as far as employee count, I think we would go back and, and do some research, mm -hmm. uh, look at our, our previous annual reports, 
Um, and just for the sake of, of time, um, I think what would be useful is if you can get us that information and then you can submit it to, to the committee and then we can, we can post it online. Just because I think it is an important question and I just want to make sure I'm keeping us on track today. So why don't you give them um, now publicly other uh, information that you'd like them to gather for us so that we all hear that and um, and then we can have you do that uh, over the next week or so mm -hmm. and then get that back to us. Great, just some detail on how the, uh, since the funding has changed, how over the last decade the provision of services have changed, whether it be with regard to employee count, uh, whether it be to, because my analysis, my quick math, and I wasn't very good at it, but my quick math of the 81 channels and 18,000 hours comes to roughly 0.6 hour per channel uh, per day. Uh, so if you could if you could speak to that with regard to how original programming might have changed over that decade as well, I think that might be helpful to the uh, to the organization uh, to this group. Uh, and then just uh, two other follow up matters here. Uh, also, if you could. Uh, Include in that as well. Uh, I know in your annual reports you give balance sheets and perhaps some maybe cutting from the annual report some direct data on uh, savings or cash on hand uh, by the AMOs that maybe may exist in CD forms or investments or other or other nature, so that we could have access to that information. And then one, uh, two additional questions. One you might be able to comment on here uh, this morning. I know you spoke to the annual reports. Uh, I'm just curious if you can speak to, I know that the vast majority of members, to my knowledge, are able to file that in your report uh, on time. Uh, do you have experience as to whether some members might not be able to file that? If they do not file it, are there parameters in place that can assist uh, to getting that in your report filed? Um, I know there was, there have been historically issues of uh, AMOs wanting to provide 990s when the, with the annual report. We did, uh, as you know, we um, were able to change the uh, um, due date from 120 to 150 days after the end of the fiscal year to help uh, in that. Um, I think uh, there might be very AMO specific reasons um, that we could uh, talk to AMOs if, if uh, we have anyone in mind that we're waiting for. Um, but I, I, I think in general that would be probably a case-by-case -case basis of what's going on at that center. Okay. Uh, again, thank you both. Senator, that's, that's okay. that is all my questions. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay. I have a question um, in, that has to do with penetration. Uh, so primarily, uh, the AMO is broadcast by cable, right? Uh, by, by cable and uh, via our websites. And via the websites, so over the internet. Mm -hmm. So in areas like the Northeast Kingdom and other rural areas where there isn't a lot of uh, broadband, um, that hampers your, the ability of uh, citizens to actually see what you're producing, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah, does, does, uh, does a signal come over DSL very well? I mean, what, what kind of speeds do you need in terms of broadband in order to really stream your... I think uh, it probably programs. depends on the platform that you're using uh, to host the videos. A lot of platforms have gotten very good about uh, being able to read the speed at which mm. the videos are being downloaded. So depending on the, the flexibility of the platform, it uh, may or may not be uh, as good as you would hope. Mm -hmm. yeah, speaking personally, uh, our website, if you're watching and you have a slower connection, there's a high quality file or a low quality file available and automatically you'll stream that low quality file. Okay. Uh, do you get any feedback from people like in rural areas that don't, that, that can't access your stuff? Uh, I, I do quite often, yes, mm -hmm. because we're serving, other than Colchester and Milton, uh, I'm serving a, a wildly rural area, and mm -hmm. there's not a lot of cable pre penetration, mm -hmm. and uh, so I'm, I'm hearing a lot, why can't we get you? Uh, why can't we yeah. see you? I yeah. think the, the more common uh, feedback that I hear in the rural areas is people do not have cable as opposed to, or do not have access to cable as opposed to do not have internet. Um, okay. it's, it's always very welcome when we do make videos available online because 
the, the availability of cable is, is lower than the availability so of So certainly in rural communities, access to the internet is, an, an, is extremely important for this. And um, okay. basically that's it. Yeah. Yeah. Lauren Glenn, did you have something else? Yeah. OK. Yeah, Clay. Uh, thank you. Um, I just wanted to go back to um, one question about regulation and just kind of get some clarity on what exactly you mean by regulation. I think PUC does regulate cable companies, and there is in the cable rules general obligations of AMOs, but to what extent are you are the AMOs themselves actually regulated by the PUC in that does the PUC call you to you know to a hearing to examine say costs or your performance or things that you know the PUC might do with say another public utility like uh, electricity or telecommunications or something like that um, is there a different in your opinion is there a difference or a commonality with how you know the PUC is set up to regulate other entities um, I, I know I can't speak about other utilities. This is kind of what I've, this has been my career in telecommunications. Um, but I think we'd all welcome that, honestly. I mean, we always turn in our annual reports and we typically do not hear any feedback. So we usually, most of us are, enjoy our work and are happy to talk about what we do to serve the community. Okay. No, I just wanted to, you know, kind of get that out there that we're, we don't actually specifically regulate and I'm not asking that we do that necessarily. I think um, it's an I'm not important sure that aspect of yeah, the it's conversation. an important <laughs> distinction to be made in the CPG process. That's really the cable company that's being regulated, and mm -hmm. uh, the AMOs are um, a party to that in that they are either a beneficiary or they could be harmed by decisions that the PUC makes. But the PUC isn't necessarily regulating the AMO specifically. And just to make a connection to that, the budget that you were talking about or the amount of funding spent on regulatory participation it was mostly related to the cable CPGs, not to your own needs um, to go before the Public Utility Commission, yes. right? Yes. Okay. So that, that kind of flows mm -hmm. onto what yeah, you were saying. Yeah, that's where I was trying to get yeah. yeah. um, So the funding source um, pie chart that you had, it, um, mm -hmm. have you looked at other funding opportunities and sources like grants and what that would mean for you know your organization you, you mentioned briefly um, that you know you don't have development staff um, and so it, it seems to me that that would be a big change and a big investment so I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more to that um, of work that's been done to diversify revenue yes and then also what what the limitations are yeah, I would say starting with your first point about grants, um, we are a curious animal. I mean, yes, we're a nonprofit organization, but um, I, I've been applying for a lot of grants between this year and last year to try and offset some losses. And uh, it's, it's very hard. Like, typically we try and shoehorn ourselves into the line of something like uh, an educational grant. Like, we just got a grant for the, from the building and general services through the Building Communities Grant Program, and mm -hmm. we fit into the educational model. But, you know, clearly we're not a purely an educational organization. So grants can be, um, depending on what they're specifically aimed at, it can be a little tough of a fit because we're really not a, a traditional or a widespread form of nonprofits. Um, people are really working hard to do things like Dan mentioned about uh, asking people to contribute to become supporting members. You know, as we look ahead to trends of things like uh, cord cutting, sure. um, we're asking for support from the community. And that's also why we're going to the municipalities that we serve as well. And some people have long running contracts uh, where some of their costs are offset, um, but more of us are going to towns and asking for a little more to help us cover those expenses of covering all those meetings. Um, so that's a few of the ways that we've started to do it. It's certainly been a discussion at every single conference that's been held um, with media organizations in the last few years is talking about how to diversify in order to prepare us for cord cutting and more potentially drastic changes like the FCC order. And is that, the, so that's broader than just Vermont, these those discussions yes. and seeing what's going on in yeah. other 
states and jurisdictions. Yeah, okay. absolutely. And, and we'll talk more of that towards the end of today when we really get into a deeper discussion about alternative revenue models. Mm -hmm. um, so this isn't our only opportunity to do that. Any final comments that you, well not final, because you're here <laughs> every time and I appreciate that, but for today, anything else we need to know? I just want to say thank you for your time and attention to this issue. I think it really speaks volumes to um, what our role is in the state. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Great. So I need to speak briefly with um, legislative council staff. So I'm going to propose that we just take a quick three minute break, stretch, get a drink, go to the bathroom, meet you right back here. Thank you. The next thing that we're going to be talking about are uh, fees on internet service. Yes, fees on internet service providers, and we have um, on the phone Peter Blum. Is that correct? Are you still there with us? Okay, we're going to put a microphone to the speakerphone so that we might be able to hear you better. Thank you so much for joining us. You're welcome. Um, Madam Chair, I have uh, the opportunity to speak today. Um, the comments I've prepared relate primarily to the history and legal structure of the Vermont Universal Service Fund, as well as the prospects for finding additional financial support for community peg systems, with particular reference to broadband services. I plan to be reading prepared comments, which you do not have, but which I will file later if you wish. And I'm also aware that it's now about 11.20, and um, you have a scheduled adjournment at 12.30. I have about 11 pages that I've prepared, and I could, you could give me some reading for how much time you'd like me to spend. I could either read, you know, carefully, I could skim, or I could just skip to the end, depending on how much time you want to allocate. Uh, I would like to give you about a half hour. Okay, I think we can do that. I think I'll just start reading then and, uh, and try to pace myself. Okay. Thank you. Um, first, let me just introduce myself briefly. I, uh, I lived in Vermont for 35 years, don't anymore, I live in Massachusetts. Um, early in my career, I worked for the So, so Peter, for the years. Peter, yes. I'm going to have you stop for a moment. We're having some technical difficulties hearing you on this end. So if you'll just sit tight for a moment, we're going to try to figure out how to make this a little bit more audible. I think if we lower the volume. Okay. So, uh, Peter, I, actually, I, we're in a big... It's coming in quite, it's, it's coming in quite distorted to me too when you speak so I don't know if the volumes are too high or what. Can you try lowering the volume? Yes, we're going right. to try lowering the volume. So I'm going to lower our volume and if you're on a speaker phone please pick up and speak directly into the phone. Okay, is that better? Yeah. yeah. Can you go, can you speak a little more? Go ahead Peter, say a few things. All right, testing, testing, I'll just, I'll start until you interrupt me again and then I'll, and then I'll stop. Um, I worked for the uh, Legislative Council as a young person for about 10 years. Uh, I worked for Governor Kunin as Deputy Secretary of Administration, and then most of my career was at the Public Service Board. How's this going? Is this all right? It's better. It's, it's not still, great. It's still a bit actually loud. Oh. A little bit away, yes. Okay, we yeah, just... I, I, I wonder if I should, um, would it be better for you if I just filed my comments and then we can no, no. talk another time? No, it's better now. It's better? Okay. All right. Anyway, um, during my time at Public Service Board, I um, worked on telecom matters, and I testified in the legislature frequently, and I drafted the bill that became the 1994, in 1994, it became the Vermont Universal Service Fund, and I managed that fund for about a decade. After retiring from Vermont State Employment about 10 years ago, or 12 years ago now, actually, I uh, worked for the National Regulatory Research Institute, and I later have worked as a consultant in telecom uh, with a range of clients, including state utility commissions, public advocates, and even a small telephone company in the Midwest. So the first topic I'd like to talk about is universal service historically. The concept dates back to the early part of the 20th century when rural areas of the country were unable to get either electricity or telephone. 
Vermont worked hard in cooperation with federal agencies to solve this problem. It created Velco and it allowed municipal electric companies to cooperate to form co-ops. But Vermont's efforts to expand telephone service were not quite as aggressive. Instead, the FCC pulled most of the load in helping to get costly service into rural areas. Until the 1990s, the chief support for universal telephone service took the form of implicit transfers that arose from regulator set rates. Monthly rates for local service were set low and were nearly the same, or were the same, in cities and in the countryside. The costs were vastly different, however, so the regulators increased other charges. Business rates were higher than residential, toll usage rates were very high. Many people criticized these policies as implicit subsidies from urban areas to rural areas. In the 1990s, these subsidies looked vulnerable to competition, and there was an effort to replace these pricing mechanisms with so-called explicit mechanisms consisting of support payments. Vermont also took several important initiatives to enhance universal service. First, we adopted a lifeline program that was funded by having the Vermont telephone companies pool subsidy monies and using an industry-wide pool. In the 1990s, as the local exchange competition was coming and cross-subsidies between urban and rural areas looked doomed, it seemed that there was a, if it was cream to skim, so to speak, in Burlington and Rutland in the form of above-cost rates, it would increasingly go to the new competitors, and incumbent carriers would no longer be able to overcharge some customers for the benefit of others who impose higher costs. The 1994 Vermont Universal Service Fund statute thus created a system of explicit universal service charges and authorized distributions primarily aimed at reducing rate and service disparities that disadvantage the state's many rural customers. The Vermont legislature has recently adjusted that system by passing Act 79, which increased the VUSF charge and created some new spending programs. But Vermont's VUSF law is 25 years old. In the intervening years, telecommunications technology has changed dramatically. Cell phones are one big change. Cellular lines now have far eclipsed landline service. Many households with both services available have even terminated their landlines. Fortunately, cellular companies contribute to the VUSF, just as do wireline companies. Broadband is an even more dramatic development. In 1994, internet service was almost entirely provided as a dial-up service over the telephone net network, and it was slow. You may remember you got mail from America Online. Broadband service was something that big companies bought at a great cost from the telephone company in the form of special access circuits. The universal service problem persists today, even after these changes. The problem still is that it costs a lot to string cables to houses in rural areas that are widely separated. It doesn't matter whether those cables are copper pairs or of wire or fiber. Uh, uh, fiberglass strands. The average distance between customers is still the most compelling variable. And now PEG funding has been added to the problem list as well. Like E911 and rural network deployment, PEG is yet another communications related program which has ero an eroded funding base due in part to ever increasing usage for broadband. My next comments relate to two legal structures that I think are important on background. I agree with the Vermont Access Network memo already in your record that telecommunications policy historically has comp comprised a mixture of benefits and burdens. The benefits have included the right to use public ways, poll attachment rights, and exemption from antitrust laws. The obligations have been many but have often included unique and intrusive regulatory systems and unique taxation burdens. Those obligations also classically included the obligation to extend the existing lines to, new, to serve new areas, the so-called carrier last resort obligation. Later, we added the duty to pay the VUSF surcharge, a revenue stream devoted to promoting benefits in the telecommunications, telecommunications space. 
One key decision made in 1994 by the Vermont legislature was that since the VUSF would support programs that benefited both intrastate and interstate telephone service, both of those services would be surcharged equally. This decision, intended to secure the benefit in the fairest possible way, also created a legal risk. The legal fiction of intrastate and interstate is almost as old as the telephone itself. Intrastate telecommunications were mainly the calls that originated and terminated in a single state. Interstate calls across state lines. Telephone companies had to live in both worlds in this greatly complicated rate setting. The division worked because calls were the unit of nearly all communications. And for billing purposes, the network kept track of where each call originated and terminated. Telephone companies were treated as dual entities, each with two revenue streams and two separate sets of costs. The states and the FCC each tried to avoid intruding by setting rates only with their own, within their own regulatory, quote, jurisdiction. Today, there's very little equipment or traffic in the telecommunications network that one can fairly characterize as inherently intrastate or interstate. The reason is primarily technology. Digital packets, the digital packet has replaced the call as the basic unit on the network, and nobody tracks or wants to track where these packets originate or terminate. Nevertheless, the jurisdictional fiction still powerfully influences regulatory policy and specifically universal service. For example, federal USF charges apply only to, quote, inter interstate telecommunications. And the FCC asserts broad jurisdictional power over those interstate telecommunications. Thus, what is interstate has virtually no surviving technological significance, but it is still legally paramount, especially as a rationale for federal preemption of state regulation and even of state taxes. And I want to talk about the Internet Tax Freedom Act. As of yet, there is no VUSF surcharge on broadband. This may have made sense 25 years ago when the Internet was still a young technology needing shelter. By contrast, today's broadband service is the dominant stream. It carries both voice, telephone, and video as mere applications. But Vermonters are today are paying for extra broadband deployment under a telephone surcharge that was, that was designed 25 years ago, before many people even knew what the word broadband meant. And broadband is a large market to overlook. Most customers, even in Vermont, have broadband available at their location, and most subscribe. My own cable provider charges me 150% more for my internet service than for my telephone service. Moreover, customers increasingly are cutting their cable service and rely on internet video streaming, imposing substantial charges on only a portion of the market can create competitive distortions over time. Moreover, such a system can be unfair, especially to poor or elderly customers who may be unable to afford broadband, but who still need telephones. In sum, broadband has become the key telecommunications goal for the 21st century, and the broadband dog now wags the telephone tail. Broadband has also begun to affect cable television revenues as more and more customers terminate their traditional video subscriptions and rely instead on internet streaming from companies like Hulu and Netflix. I recommend below several options that might allow for increased peg funding by altering charges on broadband. Before offering them, however, I want to discuss the terms of the Internet Tax Freedom Act, which is a possible barrier to any such step. The basic provisions of the ITFA is to pro prohibit state and local taxes on Internet access. This today includes broadband access, although originally it meant such dial-up service as America Online. The ITFA was first enacted in 1998 as a temporary moratorium, but it has now become a permanent feature of federal law. The ITFA has four exceptions, which I want to mention here. First, there is a broad grandfather clause that protects the existing VUSF. It exempts from the federal act all state, federal, all state universal service funds in effect on February 8, 1996. 
The Mark's USF surcharge was initially imposed before this date, but it has never applied to Internet access. Thus, the exemption is likely of little value to current Vermont law. If Vermont were to amend the, the USF to include broadband, I think the courts would likely hold that Vermont had dissolved whatever grandfather protection it may benefit from today. Another exemption is benefit fees. The first, uh, this is a fee imposed for a, quote, specific privilege service or benefit conferred. As was discussed in the DAN memo in your record, this is the basis on which the Oregon Supreme Court upheld the license fee in Eugene, Oregon. The court held that this fee was not preempted by the ITFA because it was a fee entitling the, the cable company to use the city's rights of way. Under this model, a fee could be imposed on broadband providers other than utilities Peter, who use the public. Can you ask him what he and, and other, oh, excuse me, and other utilities Peter? who use the public rights of way. Yes. P Peter, can you pause for a second? Can you just, um, can you tell, tell who's asking the question? Oh, I'm sorry, okay. I can't, I can't, yeah. I, I, could you go closer to the microphone? I'm getting a lot of echo and it's hard to understand what you're saying. Okay. Can you hear me now? Speak right Yeah, now. pretty well. Oh, I didn't know if the microphone was working. Okay, uh, this is Andrea Papiti. I am uh, analyst for the commission. Um, and I just had a question if you could clarify, because I'm, I'm still having a hard time hearing you. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm terribly sorry, but there's so much echo that I can't understand yeah. what you're saying. That, that's okay, but could you? That mic is going to Oh, that echo. mic is going yeah, Should I continue? Should I continue? No, well, but she just does that, that he'll hear her better. It's, can you hear me good. now? Is that, is that better? Oh, that's way, way better. Okay. Yeah. Because, so you were mentioning Oregon and how there was a tax that was, or a fee that was found to be okay, but I'm not sure what that was actually called and what it actually did. I just kind of heard um, a little bit of what you were saying. So just so I can... Yeah. I'm not sure that I can, can tell you much without further research, but the case involved a city franchise of a cable company, and the city decided that it wanted to impose a charge on um, the right of the use of the city's rights of way. And I don't, what I don't know is whether it also applied to you know, telephone companies and electric companies or just to this, this one litigant. Um, but, um, the, the, the reason I mentioned it was that it was using this exemption in the ITFA and upholding the, uh, the fee. So I guess I, to answer in any more detail, I would need to go back and do some more research. Okay. okay. Did you have a follow-up? Should I continue? No, it's, it's actually on Lauren's um, memo. So we have another reference to it somewhere else, so please continue. Thank you. I, I do have a follow-up to All right. it. If, if you're going to provide some data to that, sir, if you would not mind also uh, speaking to the federal cap with regard to franchise fees and how they were implicated in that particular case. Okay. Well, I, I, I'm not sure if I... Um, and going to provide additional data, but we can talk about it later okay. if you'd like something further from me, okay? Thank you. Um, okay, so just continuing with my presentation then. Um, the fee could be provided on, could be imposed on broadband providers and as well as other utilities who use public rights of way. Um, there are several legal issues with this approach, however, including the terms of existing cable franchises, and implications for various forms of property taxation, and I do not offer any opinions here on those issues. Um, the third major exemption I want to discuss in ITFA is at the tail end of ITFA, and it is the 911 charges exemption. And I have sent a handout to you which has that text. I hope you have that we before do. you because we have that nothing in this act bracket. Okay. So the only limitation here is that the funds so raised must be expended only for that purpose. And as you may know, some but not all current USF proceeds are used for E911 purposes. Actually, I think the majority are. Therefore, if you were to revise the statute 
uh, so long as the 911 portion of the broadband access charge was separately imposed and deposited into a special fund used only for E911, the statute would continue to exempt um, the, that surcharge from ITFA. The fourth and most complex by far exemption in ITFA is the universal service exemption. It applies to all state universal service funds, quote, authorized by Section 254 of the Communications Act, which was the 1996 Telecom Act. And that's in, the, that's in your handout also. It begins with the word state authority. Oh, I'm sorry, no, it's just a short thing. And it refers to subsection F of 254 of the 1996 Act, which is also in your handout, which is a longer portion, beginning with the word state authority. And I think the copy you have, I italicize and underline several phrases that are particularly problematic and, and because they're so vague. Um, they're, because it's so complex and, and vague, there are many avenues for legal challenge. Um, and it is even more complex maybe than a piece of the first light because Vermont may or may not be free to define terms for its own purposes, terms such as telecommunications. The statute requires telecommunications carriers that provide intrastate telecommunications service to pay USF charges to the states. Those charges must be equitable and non-discriminatory, a standard that is open to wide interpretation. Historically, Section 254F has been interpreted by the courts narrowly to mean that the states can impose a, BUSF, a USF surcharge only in intra, on intrastate service and therefore not on intrastate service. The two sound so similar. I, I can hardly tell myself which one I said. Fortunately, Vermont avoided the challenge to its current USF statutes because Vermont's USF is an exercise of its sovereign taxing power and is not delegated authority under Section 254. Vermont's USF statute was modeled on a Supreme Court decision uh, that was decided about five years before the Vermont law passed, and that Supreme Court decision upheld in Illinois, tele in Illinois telecommunications sales tax. The statute creates authority only to collect funds from certain telecommunications carriers. Under recent FCC decisions, broadband access providers neither provide telecommunications services nor are they carriers. Also, state laws must be not inconsistent with FCC rules. I am not aware of any FCC formal rules on the question of imposing state USF charges on internet access. Nevertheless, as discussed below, the FCC has seemingly signaled their intention to do, do just that in an appropriate case. The statute also allows for states to provide additional definitions and standards to preserve and advance universal service. This language is obscure, but in context it is understood to authorize additional supplemental state USF funds. Regrettably, and from my point of view, this delegated power is subject to two important limitations. One, it has to be specific, predictable, and sufficient mechanisms, and two, they must not rely on federal universal service support mechanisms or burden them. Federal courts have repeatedly overturned state efforts to broaden the base for their universal service programs using a variety of rationales based in the statute. In 2004, a federal court invalidated Texas's effort to include interstate revenues in its universal service base because it failed to be equitable and non-discriminatory. Another federal court invalidated Oregon's effort on the ground that a state universal service fund surcharge burdened federal universal service mechanisms. The South Carolina Supreme Court has taken an opposite view, however. Vermont statute has never been challenged on the basis of Section 254F, even though we surcharge interstate telecommunications. Possibly this was because it was drafted to emulate the Illinois Telecommunications Sales Tax Law, which had been upheld by the Supreme Court in 1989. I now, I know my time is almost up, I now want to talk to uh, three options that I want to present to you. Um, and I'll try to finish in five minutes, if that's okay, Madam Chair. 
That would be wonderful. I was just about to give you the five minute warning, so you're right on target. Okay, okay. Uh, so three options. One is add broadband to the, the USF base. Um, this is an obvious choice. Um, it would reduce uh, competitive distortions and it would help the poor people who have phones but no broadband. Um, it is also, I think, consistent with the intent of the 1994 legislature, which insisted that all telecommunications, not just intrastate, should contribute to the USF. I think it raises considerable litigation risk, however. I discussed with Bob the earlier the traditional legal fiction that divides telecommunications regulatory jurisdiction into intrastate and interstate regimes. The FCC has repeatedly insisted that broadband is exclusively interstate for purposes of regulation. This policy not only precludes state regulation of rates in terms of service for broadband, but in its arrogance, the FCC also supposes that it has control over which state and local taxes may be applied to interstate traffic. In a 2015 decision, the FCC said in, page, in paragraph 400 and something, the text that you have in the handout, I think it's on, I think it's on page two of your handout, yeah. predicting that even though they don't have any rules uh, prohibiting states from doing this, they would likely preempt. So um, this decision was issued in 2015 during the Obama administration. Uh, and much of that order has been reversed subsequently under the Trump administration, but not the above prediction. It is widely believed that the FCC would still, still subscribe to this policy and would quickly seek to preempt any state effort to subject broadband revenues to state universal service charges. By the way, this is a change from, uh, I think I, Mr. Yanchatka, I think, uh, you and I may have spoken in February, and I had the opposite opinion, so I've, I've, I've changed my mind about this since we spoke last last winter. Uh, the, so, clause of, the last clause Peter, of the quote I gave you suggests, yeah. Peter, my, uh, Representative Yantachka, um, could you clarify then what your position is? Is your position that uh, it likely would not succeed if, if there were a challenge, or is your position the other yeah, I, 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 I'm about to do that, but um, okay. yeah, I, I think I think there's substantial litigation risk. Um, if the FCC were to preempt the state from imposing USF's charges on broadband access, I think the legal outcome is in some doubt. Nevertheless, if Vermont were to go down this path, even though you have a chance for success, um, FCC preemption is highly likely, and the ultimate success would depend on the outcome of a long and costly appeal. Does that answer your question? Uh, yes, thank you. That, that's okay. what you stated Second, in your handout, uh, in your longer edition handout, right? I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. <clears throat> that was what you stated in your longer edition handout, in a footnote, I think. Um, well, in my handout, I gave you the FCC quote, and what I just said is in the prepared remarks that I've made, which I will be glad to file with you if you'd like. That would be wonderful. It is, I know okay. we're all concentrating very hard on your words, and I can tell because most people in the room have their eyes closed so they can focus on the sound, <laughs> so uh, myself nope. included. So if you could submit them in writing, I know that would be very helpful. All right, sure. You don't, there's nobody snoring, is there? No, nope, not here, no <laughs> snores. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the second option is to broaden the sales tax. Um, Aband the suggestion is to abandon the USF model entirely and apply the sales tax to telecommunications, including broadband. Uh, thus, the current USF surcharge and funding programs would be merged into the state's general tax structure, and BS USF programs would be funded from the general fund using the normal appropriations process. I make this suggestion sorrowfully, first because it's a huge change in the state law, and second because it's an admission of final defeat for one of the original objectives of the 1994 law, which I was involved with. That law was passed at a time when the telephone industry provided many cross subsidies in which one, by which one customer helped another. Uh, the VOSF was a state program, but we tried to keep the system of uh, implicit subsidies uh, as far out of the budget as we could and as, as similar to the pre-existing conditions as possible. Uh, 
we wanted to maintain the system by which the telephone industry continued to raise funds and continue to see them spent only on telephone network benefits. But that goal has been frustrated in large and small ways subsequently. First, the accountants decided that notwithstanding the language that the legislature had passed, the USF is state funds and belongs in the state of county system. I'll skip the intervening chapters, but the big disappointment now for me is that the VUSF spending provides benefits across the telecommunications network, primarily to broadband, and it can raise funds only from a small portion of that network. The tail is paying for the whole dog, in other words. If the sales tax can overcome this and broaden the base to all retail telecommunications built in Vermont, that would be a way to restore the original objective. My third, the third option is to, um, uh, is widely understood to avoid the problem the FCC's claimed intention to preempt any state USF charges on broadband. I think the FCC is endlessly clever in finding ways to expand its own jurisdiction, but I accept the common, that the common wisdom that connection charges stand a good chance of avoiding a, a preemption effort. The method is to stop looking at revenue from telecommunication service and focus instead on the wires and other facilities used to provide that service. In most cases, there is a monthly or yearly charge, quote, per connection. A connection would be a telephone line or a broadband line. A line that provides both might be one or two connections as you choose. Connection plans are not ideal because some connections have data rates thousands of times faster than do household DSL or cable modem services. So any connection plan can, should consider whether all connections are equal, and if not, how to charge for the fast ones. A recent study by the National Regulatory Research Institute indicates that connection charges for universal service purposes have been instituted in Maine, Nebraska, New Mexico, and Utah. Maine has imposed a fee of 21 cents per line or telephone number per month uh, with a limit of 25 lines per account. Uh, being billable for its telecommunications education access fund. A parallel change is being considered for the state USF. <clears throat> Nebraska has applied a flat rate per connection charge of $1.75 per year to each residential line and small business line. Meanwhile, large customers will continue at least for the moment, excuse me, for the moment to pay out a percentage of revenue basis. Mexico, responding to a continuing decline in intrastate telecommunications revenues, has prescribed a new connection charge of $1.24 per year per, quote, communications connection. And last, Utah has imposed a charge of $0.60 cents per month per access line. That concludes my remarks, Madam Chair. Thank you for the chance to speak with your committee. Mr. Blum, thank you so much. I know this was not ideal circumstances, but we very much appreciate your time and your testimony, and we look forward to um, reading uh, the comments that you'll submit. Um, you can send those to um, the uh, to Mike Farrant. It's on the website for the committee. It has the, the email address there. And again, thank I've you. Been, I've, been working, I've been working with Mike Farrant. Can I just send it to Mike? Yes, no. exactly. Wonderful. Thank you so much for okay. your time. Thank you and goodbye. Okay, thank you. I think it doesn't make a lot of sense to keep him on the line to ask and answer questions since we're all, I think, on, yes. the, on the verge of a migraine. Um, but it's certainly useful to have that, you know, 40,000 foot view, at least for me. Um, to get a sense of um, where we're at as we launch into the next big part of our discussion, uh, which is on alternative revenue models. And I'm going to turn it over to Lauren Glenn at this point. Thank you. So um, Peter's paper is actually referred to in the memo that I sent you. Um, and I will, what I'd like to do is just call your attention to the memo that I sent you, and then I'm going to take up some of the alternative funding ideas that are contained in them. Um, just to say about this memo, the uh, first 
few pages are meant to recap some of the discussions that we've had about the nature of U.S. telecommunications and media regulation. So that's page four. Mm -hmm. um, U.S. communications policy is based on an exchange of public benefit for commercial access to the public rights of way. So there's a little summary there that we talked about last meeting. And then we, on the next page five, talks about <coughs> the value of PEG, which we have talked about um, today and previously. Yep. Yeah. Um, and then page seven, um, item four, really talks about how we have started to focus on the PEG is distributed on the internet not just on cable, and so we wanted to start to look at the internet as a possible revenue source for, and um, given that there is no public benefit requirements from Title I internet, according to the FCC, so that has been a curiosity of this committee, which is what's led to this conversation today. Um, on, on page eight, there are links to the different ways that the FCC is foreclosing on the state's authority to um, require a, a public benefit in exchange for the use of the rights of way. And on the bottom of that is the paper that, um, the presentation that Peter gave in February to the, I think it was Senate Finance. And uh, a lot of what he talked about today is included in that, the first half. But what he did was he went back and he looked at the constraints on state authority. And so, um, so here I get to the meat of the presentation. So there are a number of ways that local authorities um, tax or collect fees from telecommunication carriers. Um, and what's really interesting on page 10 um, is a recap by a, a company, a telecommunications company called Mitel, if you go to their website, and they say, here are all the taxes and fees that we pay to the states and localities, and it's really quite impressive, the contribution that these companies and their rate payers make to the public coffers. Um, and this is a handful of them, so just at a very high level on page 10, and we could, um, maybe Rob, can you just um, scroll to page 10 on that presentation? Um, so just very high level and then we'll drill down. There are communications taxes. There are franchise fees, as we've discussed, for cable. There are um, sales taxes, district taxes, excise taxes, utility user taxes, and telecommunications kinds of fees and taxes. So. On a very high level, states and localities are, and the federal government is pretty creative in how it accrues value from um, these firms. Swill rides and theater tickets and anything that is amusement in the city of Chicago. And it recently um, applied this tax to online entertainments and amusements. And under that would be your Netflix, your online gaming. And so this sales tax is applied at the point of purchase. Now this has been contested. There's obviously pros and cons. Um, most recently there's been a, um, a suit against this application of the tax. But I just, again, I'm gonna kind of go quickly, but I think it's an interesting example of a kind of sales tax that is on the consumption of amusements and entertainments. Yeah. I think I could ask a question about that. Sure. When you say uh, on, on, um, on the providers, is this uh, a tax that's levied against Netflix or uh, purchasers of Netflix services? And can it be passed down to the, the consumer in, in these examples? It's, I believe in this case that it is the consumer pays it at point of purchase, and then Netflix has to pay it to the city. Thank you. So this would apply only to entertainment over the internet that you pay for. Right. So it applies to a whole series it's, of entertainments, are, but this... You can get free uh, programs. Yeah, this is for a, an entertainment that you purchase, okay. so you would so pay a sales, sales tax, tax on it. So it, I think it works like when you buy something on Amazon and the sales tax is applied 
based on the percentage for the locality that you're in, and then they are responsible for paying that back to the state. Okay. Right. Um, and again, I just want to say this is not without controversy, right? None of these actually are. Um, there is also, just to add to this, in Massachusetts, there is a bill um, along these lines to implement a sales tax on online entertainment designed to give 20% to the state, 40% to the local government, and 40% to the local peg channels. <coughs> So there's a link to that um, legislation there. It's, it's been recently introduced. I think the prognosis, I mean, they're gonna move ahead with moving this forward. I think some people say it won't happen. Some people say it could happen. We don't know yet. But that's an interesting solution from the PEG community. Um, in Minnesota, there is a heritage tax. Again, this is a kind of sales tax, but there was a coalition of arts organizations and outdoors education, um, outdoor uh, hunting, fishing sort of organizations that came together and were successful in adding a half a percent to preserve Minnesota heritage. It's also written into the Constitution, which is interesting. It cannot be vetoed or swept into the general fund, and it generates, in a, obviously a much bigger state, $150 million a year to fund wildlife conservation and the preservation of arts and culture. These are distributed through um, grants, and so PEG Access are among many nonprofits that apply to use these funds. So it's an interesting twist on um, the sales tax and an interesting coalition that brought that together. Um, then we move into the realm of telecommunications tax, and I, you know, the, the caveat is I am not a telecommunications lawyer. Um, I am a researcher, but there are some examples here. Massachusetts has a sales tax on telecommunications. Um, in Eugene, Oregon, there has been a telecom tax. Of course, the recent FCC ruling um, was aimed, uh, FCC ruling applying to in-kind payments of cable operators towards public benefits, and the FCC really was very focused on Eugene's tax and the Oregon court decision that upheld it. And the FCC said, um, there's a quote here at the bottom. Let's see. To address this problem, we now, ex this is the FCC speaking, expressly preempt any state or local requirement, whether or not imposed by a franchising authority, that would impose obligations on franchise cable operators beyond what Title VI allows. So I think Dan actually would be more expert in discussing the pros and cons of this, but this is an example of a telecommunications tax, which again is not without its, uh, it's fra a fraud. It's, mm -hmm. it's, I think as Peter said, it faces litigation risks. <laughs> Um, the next example that w we came up with, which was is an interesting one, um, is spectrum proceeds, and I know that that has been a, a topic of discussion in the legislature and a little bit of a sore spot for Vermont Public Television. Um, the board is currently discussing how it will expend the proceeds of the sale of Vermont Spectrum, and but in. Um, Philadelphia, the public television outfit decided to sell all its channels and to achieve its mission in a different way by generating $135 million and distributing it through grants to foster free speech, diversity of ideas, free expression, et cetera. So um, Holly Groshner is willing to come in and talk more about it. I'm not sure it actually has legs as a source of revenue for PEG, but it certainly is a way that the state is going to be funding public benefit media. So those are the things that have happened that are in play, That and the, it certainly is not an exhaustive list, um, but it might be worth us discussing if we want to go down any of these roads and thinking about it. 
The next, the next section here are about emerging policy ideas. So these are ideas that are not yet um, fully in play, but are being talked about. Um, the Massachusetts legislature has a bill under consideration to look at the state's news deserts and how to solve that issue. So that's a at a study stage, but this idea of news deserts is one that's gaining currency, just like food deserts have been, and how to address the gaps in news and information in areas where local newspapers are, have closed and there are no local alternatives. Um, I think that it's pretty, uh, it's safe to say that PEG access is one answer to local news deserts. It is debatable whether Vermont has big news deserts, but it is a core idea that's gaining currency. And then this idea of communi community information districts. So along the lines, I think um, Karen's gonna talk a little bit about local municipalities creating tax districts themselves. And this idea, which is not yet, um, yeah, I think in New Jersey, it's gaining, gaining, some, um, ga gaining some momentum. But as of right now, it's, it's an idea about creating information districts that have some taxing authority to generate revenue to support local media. And then this last one I think has less applicability for the legislature, but just is an interest, it's, uh, it's interesting um, because it's research done by the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas about how to um, address digital divide and uh, diversity of ideas, et cetera, using the CRA as a mechanism. But as we know, the CRA tends to be implemented on a bank by bank basis. It's not kind of a big statewide initiative. But I think that that report itself adds some legitimacy to thinking about the use of community based resources to address disparities in distribution of the internet and distribution of news and information. So, yeah. So this is really meant to generate discussion and thought about ways that we might want to think, pursue this, and research that we might not need some help with from Ledge Council to talk about some more. Thank you. Questions for Lauren Glenn before we move on to Karen. Um, I do have one comment. In, sure. Uh, with respect to the uh, the tax on the right-of-way, you know, um, and, and I'm not a lawyer, but it just seems to me that um, the state and the municipalities own the rights-of-way, and what federal government gets to tell you what you can charge for rent, it's, it's not really a tax. I mean, I would characterize this as rents for use of the right-of-way that's owned by the state and the localities. But what page are you on here? That was on, that's on page 13, the bottom, and it talks about the FCC's re order um, aimed at the court decision. Okay. So, um, like, where do they get, excuse me. No, I'm sorry. Where do they get off <laughs> expressly preempting state or local requirements? That's a state's rights issue, it seems to me, anyway. The research, again, I think Clay would have more to say about this, but the research that I've done on the, um, the state's right-of-way lease and rent, so the Agency of Transportation um, makes deals with private entities that want to use state property, and they create lease arrangements or renting arrangements. Um, those arrangements go into a fund, those funds go into a fund that are used for transportation purposes. And both in that case and in the case of pole attachments and the rent that is charged for pole attachments by Green Mountain Power and other electric companies, there seem to be restrictions on those entities' ability to charge anything more than the cost of maintenance. It, it, there seem to be prohibitions on the ability to add extra fees for public benefit uses over and above the cost of actually managing the physical right of way. Mm -hmm. So you may be able to add to that, but there, are, there, there doesn't seem to be a lot of latitude that we have to pile on to what is currently being accrued from the direct use of the rights of way. 
without a policy discussion. Right. And, and uh, I would, um, oh, sorry, no, no, no. I would just um, say that there is some risk there because in our broadband discussion this last session, um, you don't want to actually discourage the deployment of, of, of broadband um, service to rural areas where it's not happening now. So there's a balance there, but it just kind of s strikes me. Did you want to? Yeah, just, just to say that I think AOT um, restrictions on or requirements for what they charge the use of the right of way comes from federal funding obligations and federal highway rules about how states manage rights of way that receive federal funding. Whether they're controlled by the federal government or not, if they receive federal funding, that's kind of the, um, has been the federal hook for um, putting uh, obligations on states or uh, restrictions on what states can do with their right of way. And that's not to say we couldn't look into it more. I think that's really the, where we are today. Right, and, and just, to, just to finish, I think that, I know it was hard to hear Peter, but I think the most important thing that he said were the last two things, which was the potential to broaden the sales tax so I think what he was proposing is rather than having, um, is, to, is to look at how the Universal Service Fund is, is collected and that, that, they, that may no longer actually be serving us. He said the tail's wagging the dog. Mm -hmm. And to maybe um, look instead at a sales tax that's on the use of telecommunications. And then this idea of connection charges which focuses on the wires and not the service itself. And there um, are some good examples. He sent me that paper. I think he could also, may have sent it to Mike, um, where the main Nebraska, Utah, New Mexico examples are included. So I think that I, I would not lose that thought. I think that was an important contribution he made to the discussion. Just, can I add two comments on, on, on that? Uh, so I think that we should look at those and we should have an open discussion on them. The, the question that I would have is uh, whether or not this has been looked at or I think the word is called scored uh, from uh, with the functional equivalent of the Department of Revenue or Taxes to uh, speak to a little bit of that uh, going forward. And then with regard to the connection plan, I don't know the answer to this, but perhaps we can dig into it regarding Maine, Nebraska, New Mexico, and Utah, as uh, Peter spoke to. Uh, I would be interested to know if in those communities today, if there is a 5% uh, franchise fee that exists, and if there is in those communities, what percentage of the franchise fee goes specifically to PEG access today? I would just comment with respect to the sales tax also that right now 100% of the sales tax goes to the education fund and it would be a fraught discussion in the sure. legislature um, to talk about sales tax revenues even if you're expanding it anyway. But yeah, so, um, oh, so I, should I talk about my table here? Oh, I would love that. <laughs> okay. Karen. So th this is actually a table that we put together for the Government Operations Committees a couple of years ago. And, and all it really does is list out the variety of intermunicipal districts um, and their purposes that are authorized in statute today in Vermont. And um, we can only, uh, we're Dillon's real estate, I won't explain that to you all right now, but we can only um, enter into these kinds of district entities if they're specifically authorized in statute. So I think what's interesting is that some of them, aside from the purposes um, and aside from the sort of general willingness of the legislature to say, yeah, you can try this, um, telecommunications union districts and uh, readies, um, rural economic development infrastructure districts are the most recently added. And the legislature definitely has an open mind about saying, yeah, if you think this will work to meet your purposes in, the, um, in whatever endeavor you're pursuing, we'll give you the authorizing legislation. Um, 
several of them uh, may use the property tax directly, um, basically um, school districts, which are under union municipal districts, municipalities themselves. Um, the others uh, ha can use fees that are raised from the service they're providing, wastewater or water supply fees, um, or uh, assessments that are, that are um, voted on a particular district, special assessment districts, or uh, they're funded through property taxes that are raised at the municipality and then provided to the um, to the whatever the special district is. Uh, I should mention that with respect to mass transit authorities, which is a little more than halfway down the list and provides for public transit, GMTA, those kinds of things, that uh, Actually, it's a mix of apportioning um, costs to each member of the municipality. So up in Chittenden County, where you've got bus lines in, in Burlington, South Burlington, and so forth, the, they, they have an assessment that they pay to the, um, to the Mass Transit Authority. But the out-towns are based on donations. So then in the same way that the peg stations go and ask the towns for a donation at town meeting, that's what um, the public transit uh, authorities do as well. And the, as you can see, there's a variety of governance models there also. So that's just by way of what's in place today. And I don't know if there's questions or. Do you see any applicable to this conversation? Well, it's interesting because the telecommunications union municipal district. Um, might might be one that could be sort of twisted to apply to tax stations. Um, but you know, it would be these aren't statewide groups. These are these are groups that are um, created by a number of municipalities, generally speaking, adjoining each other. So the the public safety authority um, in Central Vermont is two towns now that have gotten together. The, um, the mass transit authorities might be the most um, expansive in terms of number of municipalities, but there's not, a, um, there's not a statewide group. The only other one that comes to mind that um, is not on this list yet, but will be at some point are the clean water service providers, which is embodied in legislation that you passed this year um, to address clean water, and that uh, is going to be um, deployed, implemented through regional entities yet to be created. Clay, did you have a question? I do. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Thanks. So. We have 15 minutes, and I would love to know from the, the group here, Lauren Glenn has given us a lot to chew on, as has Karen uh, and Peter. Are there ideas that individuals have had on this work group about funding sources that haven't come up in uh, the documents and the testimony that we've heard so far? I know I'm still digesting all of this, but I'd love to just talk to the group about what other ideas should we be putting on the table. So can I offer one thing? Sure. Uh, I like your word digest. I think we have a lot of digesting to do. There's a lot to, to digest, and I and I'm I, I want to be clear that, as I said earlier, we we only have you know a few more meetings. We're going to also have a public hearing. I know that in speaking with the vice chair, we want to head into the legislative session with um, some kind of roadmap on this issue. And so I think we all feel somewhat pressed for, for time and space. And so I think some of what needs to happen is going to be outside of this work uh, here in this room that each of us need to sit down and really, as I said, digest. So, um, but we will not be having additional uh, meetings beyond this. That is not our charge. And so we all have to take on the responsibility of doing some of this uh, intellectual work on our own before we come back together. So. 
I think that's a good idea that we commit to doing that before before our next meeting. Uh, I also think we'll be a little more public with the resolution sure. of our uh, bigger issue, which hopefully will uh, 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 look favorably upon our work. You know, I want to say, too, that I think that uh, everyone has done a great deal of work. Our public presenters, uh, so far the members of the, the group that have presented, and I just want to be, uh, at least from my perspective, I want to respectfully be careful that we don't just keep in mind that we don't become a solution in search of a problem as well in the sense that we look at current funding mechanisms, we look at the trends that have existed over the past decade, uh, and we look out into the future to be sure that we continue to keep PEG and the AMOs as a viable option, uh, but that we are just careful in that approach as well. Well, I think you make a good point because we're not, and the revenue isn't declining steeply today, this minute. Mm -hmm. And so if we, f for example, were to say, oh, let's have a half cent on the sales tax as a way forward, it, it's really hard to make a case that you need that money in 2021, 2022. So I, I think we have to just keep that in mind of how we might structure some mm -hmm. alternatives, how we might lay the groundwork for revisiting the alternatives. Sure. I, I, so I, th I think we have to think about um, some other models that may also maybe include kind of trust fund models or just we have to take the long view because what will happen probably, I mean, I'm not, I, I, let me restate that. I don't know what will happen, but I okay. suspect that the revenue is going to be going like this. And I know that Comcast is working very hard to keep the revenue not mm -hmm. going in that direction, but you know it will start to decline. And then at the same time, the FCC is is mounting these dockets. I mean, they've just had one that we kind of, um, you know, they said we're not going to take the cost of a channel and subtract that from the funds that you received today. But we haven't yet decided. We didn't say no. We just put it aside for now. We don't know, for example, how Comcast might implement that order. The FCC is now taking up the question of leased access, which is a kind of public access, but you pay for. Um, it really, we're, we see that as a step towards making a case against peg access, ultimately. So it's, it's a steady threat. And I think we have to be positioned as a state to respond when any of those corners get turned. And so that's really what we're talking about, is how to prepare, it's how to prepare, and what makes sense, and what latitude do we have. So I, I understand the question of timing is one that's on the table. Mm -hmm. I think that's fair. I just wanted to comment. I believe that the product that the committee yes. this is in the form of draft legislation, I might have, my study committee's mixed up. Um, and so I that's why I had Mike print out our charge so that we could all remind ourselves. Does everybody have the document in front of them? Mm -hmm. So um, reading from creation under uh, section 27, PEG Access Study Committee, there is created a PEG Access Study Committee. The committee shall consider changes to the state's cable franchising authority and develop for legislative consideration alternative regulatory and funding mechanisms to support public educational and government PEG access channels and services to communities across Vermont. Yeah, and, and E yep. um, requires that the uh, report come the recommendation of draft legislation. And so that militates toward uh, coming up with an actionable, you know, well, obviously you have to. You know, right. So you're not, you can't report we're going to do nothing because <laughs> that's against the law. Um, we have to do something. Um, and so um, I, I guess the question that I'm left with after hearing today's presentation, which I thought all were very good, um, and I uh, very much appreciated uh, 
the van presentation. It's just what is the revenue requirement? Just like a black and white. Because uh -huh. I think that question answers what you do about it. If you know exactly how much money you need, when you need it. Um, without that question answered, I, I wouldn't know how to respond. Mm -hmm. Obviously, I have an employer. You know, my, my boss, his boss, has very clear um, opinions about taxation. So um, that you know, puts me in a particular position um, with regard to a discussion about taxation. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, you know, before you even get there, I think that you have to answer the question. Absolutely. What do we need? Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm not sure that we're going to be able to answer that question right now, um, right. based on you know your assessment of revenues in the next few years. Um, and and I I do <coughs> not suggesting that we do this, but I do think that we could say um, it's. We're not ripe for legislation yet. You know, if mm -hmm. there, you don't have to write legislation if it's not going to actually accomplish anything right now. Right. So, a um, couple of thoughts is one is that um, considering the change, the differences in um, distribution that we're seeing, uh, apart from broadcast over cable, now it's going over the internet and everything. I'm looking at um, how do we make the uh, funding more equitable across the various distribution channels. And uh, that's, you know, what we heard today from Peter Bloom uh, speaks to part of that. Uh, the other thing is that uh, it says the report uh, shall be in the form of draft le legislation. So um, I think that's that's something we have to do. We're going to have to come up with with a draft legislation in order to uh, reflect what we what we consider here. And I assume that's going to require us to uh, come to some sort of consensus on what that should be. I, I think it's hard to, I mean, you could say the revenue requirement's $8 million or some variation on that, or you could say that it's not realistic to expect that we would get $8 million from an alternative revenue source for the state. I mean, that's a lot of money. When $8 million comes to the table in a state budget discussion, that's a big, significant discussion. Um, so it may be that we think of some different ways to skin the cat over time, you know, start to set aside dollars that become a fund. Mm -hmm. So that, so just in terms of the dollars that are needed, I, we can give a number, but I think we then have to walk the cat backwards and say what are some of the alternative ways to get to it. And we're pretty much foreclosed from several ways of getting the money on the internet side, right? Mm -hmm. So I think for us to have some clarity about what are the ways that, you know, given what we know now, what are the two or three possible ways to skin the internet cat? <laughs> So these poor cats. There's a lot of cats. There. I'm walking a lot of cats. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. We're well, walking <laughs> forwards, backwards. Walking, skinning. Yeah. I'm <laughs> sorry. Hard. It's okay. I'm We're so all a little sorry. loopy at this point, aren't we, Glenn? Um, but I think w I think it would be really helpful to have some ledge council, re council research on, given what we know. Sure. How could we proceed? Absolutely. And then we would know how much revenue that could gen possibly generate. We could also address other issues in terms of broadband equity up here, asterisk. And it also, yeah. So I think that that would be important to know what, what, what we can do, what the legislature yeah. actually has the authority to require. And then we may start to work on, well, what is a realistic portion of this budget for the legislature to fund? Mm -hmm. And what do we expect the PEG access centers right. to go mm -hmm. out and start operating more like your typical nonprofits? Right. 
Right. So I think, I mean, I think we understand that this will ultimately be a combination of mm -hmm. state funds, municipal funds, philanthropic funds, underwriting funds, fees for service, membership. Right. You know, that that pie in 10 years is going to look different than it does today. Such an excellent point because I think, you know, Clay's qu question is a good one that we have to keep in mind what is, what is the revenue required, but the caveat is we're not charged with coming up with all the, the entire eight million and figuring that out. That as you say, we have to really think about how that pie chart is gonna evolve over the next 10, 20 years. Um, I think this is a good place to wrap. Um, I would just love to take the last couple minutes uh, Maria, if I could have you recap for us. So this was our third meeting, correct? Here's, here's a question that I have for you. So looking at powers and duties of the committee, I'm not clear on whether one of our six meetings that we um, are allowed to be reimbursed for includes the public meeting or is the public meeting in addition to and then the third question I have is, could we have a public meeting and then as a group meet at the conclusion of that public meeting? So would just love. Just about to suggest maybe that latter option to the extent there's any ambiguity, you could hold a public hearing and have a meeting immediately following. Okay. And it would all, you know, capture any of the expenses and not run into a. Great, because. That is that seventh meeting. So exactly, I mean, I think we, um, of course, we all support the public meeting. It was important for us to have it, those of us in the committee who made sure that this um, language got in, but I would be um, very scared to give up the entire work meeting to a public meeting and then not have a chance for us to digest that. And so it does mean more of a time commitment on our part to meet after the public meeting, but I wanted to get a sense from people if you're willing to do that so that we don't lose sure. that entire meeting time. Yes. Does that make mm -hmm. sense? Lauren, Glenn, does that make sense? So then what I'll do, um, I will um, huddle up with um, Maria and Mike, and we will get um, a poll out to committee members and figure out uh, dates that make sense for all of us, and we'll do that in the next couple of days so that we can get a date out to the public as soon as possible so folks can start making plans to come and, and testify. Um, do you anticipate holding that public meeting here or going outside of Montpelier, which is, you know, might get you a different set of comments? That is a great question for the committee. I have no, um, I have no agenda, and so okay. I would love to hear your thoughts on that, Karen, whether you think I we'll think you'll get a different set of comments right. outside of Montpelier. And so, of course, the danger in doing that is we have one public meeting. Right. right. Where do you hold it so it is essentially enough located that folks from around the state can attend? Mm -hmm. So again, something for us, we can certainly have this conversation uh, in addition to a doodle poll of where we think makes the most sense and where we can be accommodated. I don't think you're wrong. It's right. just um, as someone who drove two hours this morning to get here from Brattleboro, like depending on where it is, I want to make yeah. sure it's still somewhat centrally located for folks. Mm -hmm. How do other folks feel about that? And I know you. Any have location, a lot. <laughs> any location. Uh, like, I'll, go, I'll go to Brattleboro if you want me to. <laughs> yeah, it's a little easier for you. Um, I, I'd also just say I think we want to have a public hearing where we have a, something to present for reflection. In other words, we could have a public hearing where everyone comes and tells us how great public access TV is. But right. We've had those hearings. We have that already yes. written down. We mm -hmm. know that. But what I think we want is. Here are some possible ways of going forward. What do you think about that? You know, is a sales tax going to fly? Is a connection fee going to fly? You know, and make sure that we invite people, to not just the public, sure. right, all of our supporters who will come and say, keep funding public access, but people who are experts in the field or who will have an opinion on the wisdom right. of an additional sales tax that's not going to go in the ed fund, for example, just mm -hmm. example, mm -hmm. or amusement tax, or, right. you know, why didn't the cloud tax go anywhere last year? Is this going to be a rehash of that discussion? 
right? So I think we no, want to have those point. conversations here and then come up with some ideas that then could get us more insight. Absolutely. Right. I think that's an excellent point. We are here because we believe in the value of PEG access, and we have many people in the legislature who already believe in that, and many townspeople on uh, citizens across Vermont who believe in that. So we don't need to be convinced of that. We really need the brain power of the state to come and help us wrestle with these options. So I think it's a good point. And we can talk more about how we want to structure that. So anything else from the committee or from the staff? So just to clarify, yeah. um, the legislation tells us that we should have at least one public hearing. And I was under the impression that all of these meetings we're having are public hearings. Mm -hmm. So do we need one in addition to this? Our regularly scheduled meetings? I, I think as I read it, and I drafted it, but I don't really <laughs> understand exactly what was meant, but just the way that it's written on its provision again. Um, the, 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 committee, the committee's authorized to meet up to six times. At least it says on December 15. Um, the committee shall hold at least one public hearing on the value of PEG access television to Vermont communities, the cost of such programming and services, and funding options. So I read that as, you know, all of those topics are um, presented for the public to come in and talk about each of those, respond with something that you want them to respond to, but that's really a public forum, public hearing, you know, hour, hour and a half, what have you, um, that that's separate from the six meetings that the committee okay. is. Yeah, right. All right. and as someone who was on finance where we wrestled with this um, wording, as you know, this is a perfect example of hamburger making. And so, um, but I think the committee was very s strong in their belief that there should be a time dedicated that we actually invited people in. And yes, there is a public comment period for each of our meetings, but we wanted to err on the side of more input and not less input. So, so any the other public questions? hearing be after the next meeting potentially? Is that something that you would come back to us with based on? I want to have a conversation with the vice chair about the logistics going forward and, and sort of do a little backwards design, figure out where we need to end up by by when, and, and do some date checks on that. And so again, um, we're going to huddle up um, over the next week, and we'll get um, a, a doodle poll out to all of you about dates. But that's I'm not clear on that and how that should work in terms of when we need to produce a product and what, how much time we're going to need to do that. So, so bear with me. Thank you. Very much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Is our September date set?